All right. So uh, first, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, also, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate in this hybrid format. And today I'll be talking about unpredictable vibratory environments and how they affect prey capture of a funnel weaving spider. So as our human population continues to grow, so are our cities. Our cities are growing and expanding into animals' natural habitats. And with that comes a whole bunch of disturbances that we bring in these habitats, especially that coming from noise. So we produce a lot of noise coming from traffic, from construction, and um, even from airplane noise. And while we know a fair bit about how disruptive acoustic noise is to animal behavior, we know comparatively less about how substrate-borne vibrations are affecting animals. And this is really critical because, as we know, as an information source, substrate-borne vibrations are both ancient and ubiquitous. So amongst all these examples of animals that rely on vibrations to communicate and capture prey, uh, you can imagine in the backdrop of a city, there's going to be a lot of potentially vibratory noise that's affecting these behaviors. So the species that I study is Agilinopsis pennsylvanica, and they're a funnel weaving spider, and they rely entirely on web vibrations for the detection of prey and also for recording mates. So first on the left here is a video. Um, instead of a prey, I've used a vibrating toothbrush with a toothpick that's fixated on the end to kind of simulate prey so you can see how the spiders come out to those vibrations. I'm not sure if the sound will come through on these videos, but the sound isn't important. Um, it was just the sound of a vibrating toothbrush if it didn't come through. Um, and then on the right here is a video of a male courting a female. And so you'll see the male in the foreground shaking the web and also bouncing his abdomen and the female responding. So these spiders are pretty prevalent across urban and rural environments. So the first thing I did was to look at what the vibratory environment looks like across the city and into the surrounding rural areas. So on the right here is a map of the city of Lincoln, Nebraska in the United States. Um, and we had 21 sites that went around the city and also into the surrounding rural areas, just collecting the background vibrations. And on this graph here, you can see on the y-axis is the daily average LEQ, and that's just a measure of amplitude. And on the x-axis are all the different sites. And you can see that there's pretty there's a pretty wide variation in the amount of vibratory noise that's present at these sites. And it varies up to 13 decibels if you compare the quietest site with the loudest site. And if we look at these sites on the map, we can actually see that these are relatively close in space, despite having such a big difference. And if we look at the spectrogram from one of these field recorded um, noise, where we have frequency in hertz on the y-axis and time on the x, and then the, the more light green area is louder. So you can see from this that most of the noise is actually concentrated in these low frequencies, especially that below 500 hertz. And we know this is the frequency range that's very important to spiders for detecting prey um, and also courting their mates are all within these frequency ranges. So there's a high possibility that um, this noise might be disruptive. So with this experiment, we wanted to see how vibratory, how the vibratory environment affects prey detection in this spider. So first we went out and we collected spiders from both urban and rural environments to get an idea of how origin might affect uh, how they are able to detect prey. So you can see in gray here, that's the city, li city limits of Lincoln. So all of our urban spiders were collected within city limits and all the rural spiders in purple were collected uh, outside of city limits. 
So we collected these spiders and we took them into the lab. And here is a room lined entirely with acoustic foam. And there's a whole bunch of tubs on these uh, shelves. And if we look at a single tub, there's nine containers. Uh, each container housed a spider. And these containers were separated by acoustic foam to reduce the vibrations that were transferring between the containers. And if we look at the very bottom of one of these containers, we attached a contact microphone, and that's the device we use to play back vibrations from an MP3 player to the spider. So we took these spiders and then they were exposed to a playback treatment for three weeks. Um, so there were three different treatments, silent, quiet, and loud. The silent treatment had no recordings playing whatsoever. And then the loud and quiet had the same recording playing, but at different amplitudes. We used a uh, white noise that was concentrated in low frequencies below a thousand hertz. And the, the quiet treatment was very similar to the silent treatment in amplitude. And then the loud treatment was about 13 decibels louder than the quiet treatment, that same difference that we saw in the field. So the spiders were exposed to these treatments for three weeks. And then after three weeks, half of the spiders stayed on the same treatment, so going from loud to loud, and half of them switched to the opposite treatment, so from, for example, from loud to quiet. However, those that stayed, that were in the silent treatment stayed on the silent treatment for the whole six weeks. So this produced five different treatments. Um, a loud, 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 quiet, quiet, loud, quiet, quiet, and silent treatment. And here you can kind of see a breakdown of our sample sizes. Uh, we try to keep everything as even as possible. So while they were in these treatments, we measured the latency to attack a prey stimulus, and we used two different stimuli. There was a live prey item, which we used a 1 8 inch cricket. And the artificial prey that we used was the vibrating toothbrush that you saw in that first video. These stimuli were provided twice a week for the six weeks of the experiment for a total of 12 different trials. And we timed how long it took the spider to attack the stimulus after presentation uh, up, up to 30 seconds. I do want to emphasize that what I'll be showing today is just preliminary analysis. Um, we've just started to dip our toes into this data, and there's still a whole lot that we still need to investigate. Um, but for the purposes of today, I'll be showing a survival analysis since this is time to event data. Um, and we use Cox proportional hazards regression model with backward selection. The attack latency was averaged across each of the three week treatments. And then um, we also looked at condition of the spider. And just to show you, for condition, we measured the residuals of the linear model that compared the spider mass to the cephalothorax width. And then for our model, we had treatment uh, before and after that switch in treatment and origin as variables. I want to talk through a few predictions that we had. So we first predicted that spiders may take longer to attack prey in loud vibratory environments where that noise might be disruptive to the vibrations that the prey are causing. We also predicted that switching vibratory environments could slow attack rates, especially for spiders that were switching from quiet environments to loud environments. We predicted that urban spiders might be faster to adjust to these rapid changes than the rural spiders, just because urban animals typically are exposed to more rapid changes. And that spiders in better condition may take longer to assess risk versus reward, because while we're providing these uh, vibrations, uh, the spider might be assessing whether this is potential prey or a predator. So here I'll be showing the first result, and I want to take us through this step by step. So first, this slide, I'll just be showing the results from the live prey data. Um, and first, I'm just going to show a traditional survival curve where proportion of spiders that haven't attacked are on the y-axis, and we have the time in seconds on the x-axis. 
So the lower the line dips, the faster the spiders were at attacking. And the two separate graphs show before that switch, so the first three weeks versus the second three weeks. And you can see it's it's kind of hard to see what's going on here. Um, there is an effect that the spiders were attacking the prey faster after uh, the switch than before, but I want to tweak this image a little bit just so we can get a better idea of what's going on here. So to do this, uh, we've taken a five, basically a snapshot at the five second mark where this dotted line is. And this changes the y-axis to be the expected number of attacks by a spider in five seconds. Um, but that's just to say you're going to see uh, some points that represent the treatments. And the lower the points are on this graph, the slower they are at attacking and the higher they are, the faster. OK, so we've we've cleaned the image up a little bit, but it's still kind of a lot going on. So um, I want to just highlight a few things. So if we just look at the purple and the orange and also that dark gray that's in there. So these are the treatments that the spiders stayed on the same treatment for the duration of the six weeks. And you can see there's there's no effect here of the spiders before and after that switch that remained on the same treatment. However, we see something interesting when we just look at the spiders that switch treatments. So either from the loud to the quiet or the quiet to the loud. And generally what we're seeing here is that the spiders were slower to attack when they were in the loud treatment. So here the green, before they'd be in the loud here, they were slower. And in the pink on the right, they'd be slower in that loud environment over there. So if we switch to talking about the vibrating toothbrush data, um, so I'm going to be showing similar graphs here, these like snapshots at the five second mark. Um, in this one, we don't see any effective treatment, but there is an effect where they attacked much faster after the switch than before. And then on the graph on the right here, um, we'll be looking at condition, so the condition of the spider. And there's an effect that spiders in better condition were taking longer to attack the vibrating toothbrush than spiders that, that were in worse condition. I'll talk through that a little bit in just a second. So I just want to summarize and kind of discuss some of these findings. Um, so first, when we look at the live prey, there's no effective origin or condition. However, uh, slower attacks occurred when spiders were in the loud vibrations when they switched treatments. And this is going to be important for natural environments that are being rapidly uh, transformed into developed areas. Uh, we have these quiet habitats where you bring in um, construction equipment and it could rapidly change that vibratory environment. And this could have negative impacts on the spider's ability to detect prey. And then for the vibrating toothbrush, there was no effective origin uh, and no effective treatment. However, spiders that were in better condition delayed their attack of the toothbrush, but we didn't see this effect with the cricket. And this might go back to what I had mentioned about reward versus risk. For example, the cricket provides very small vibrations, like this little cupcake here. And these small vibrations uh, might be assessed as either being a small reward or a low risk. If it is a predator, it'd probably be a small predator maybe one they could fight off. Um, however, the vibrating toothbrush produces really high amplitude vibrations. Uh, so when you have something with really big vibrations, uh, it could be a really big reward, a really big cricket, for example. Uh, but there's also the high risk that these strong vibrations might be coming from a predator. So perhaps the spiders that were in better condition were taking more time to assess whether they're willing to take the risk, whereas spiders in worse condition were more likely to take that risk to get a high reward. Uh, and I didn't even present on half of what was suggested in my title about web structure. We're still working through that data. Um, 
we've collected the mass of the web after it's been dried. And we also have images that we took of the web to compare web density and variability. Um, because we hypothesize that the spiders might be altering the structure of their web in some way to decrease the effects of this vibratory noise. And so we'll also need to assess how vibrations are transferring across the web when these webs are built in different vibratory environments. And with that, I, there are so many people to thank, especially those on my committee and uh, members of the lab past and present, as well as uh, the property owners that allowed me to collect data on their properties and my funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions.